it seems to me that there are a couple of types of photographers. There are many types, but two come to mind. One is photographers who are totally gear fixated. That's their pleasure in photography is what we call the toys. And we share that characteristic. We, we love new gear and also it's our business. Okay. Yeah. You know, we're in the business of talking about, writing about, using, testing uh, this equipment. And that's why we do what we love and we love what we do. Granted. Then there are photographers who could almost care less about the equipment. As long as they get a piece of gear that suits them, they'll just go with it. Correct. And it's about the image. And we also are photographers who primarily care about the image. Yep. So that thought brings me to the current state of gear. And you and I, over the last few days as we've been traveling, uh, through uh, Washington State, Palouse area, Idaho. Uh, we've talked a lot about the fact that uh, once again we're in a revolutionary period uh, when it comes to gear. We went through it in the early 2000s, at the beginning of the digital revolution, and now 15 years later we're going through it again. And uh, I think it's a very exciting time, but what's happened is, and appreciate hearing your yep. thoughts, what's happened is sensors have become so good, these backside illuminated sensors with tremendous sensitivity and dynamic range, um, fast lenses have become less expensive, uh, fast zooms uh, with really good quality. So all of this has meant that we are now in an age where the gear counts less and less and even modestly priced or modestly sized gear is really good enough. And so my question for you is, is good enough good enough? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. Back in my phase one days, you know, there was always that expression well, where photography would go, well, you know what, it's good enough. And I actually can take this back to the film days and it's a very interesting story. Uh, this well, one well-known photographer that I knew very well and made a lot of prints for back in my lab days, um, master portrait photographer, beautiful lighting, subtle details in the shadow, just incredible the way he handled film and negative, shot with a Hasselblad, you know, you know square uh, format, and great lenses. And his work was absolutely gorgeous. Make 30 by 40s, 40 by 60s, and they were just master prints. So as time went on, he went to work for Fuji and became a spokesman for Fuji, and Fuji introduced the S5 camera, mm -hmm. which was supposed to be the wedding photographer's camera because it had the ability with these extra pixels in between pixels to uh, recover highlights. Right, little, little octagon, uh, octagonical, octagon, octagonal uh, Pixel. extra pixel. Yeah. And there was you know, like grouping. a square in between. Yeah. And it was apparently, you know, it was supposed to catch the, the overflow and, and retain the ability so that if you were photographing a wedding with tuxedos, you could have detail on the blacks, but you wouldn't blow out the bride's dress, which was very typical of the early days back in you know, digital. Mm -hmm. So, He's in the Fuji booth at a trade show, and there's this print on the back wall, and it's a 30 by 40 or so. And I looked at it, and I go, and I'll just say his name's Frank. I said, Frank, like, beautiful picture, but oh my God, if I ever made a print like this for you, you would have thrown it back in my face. And he goes, well, it's digital, and it's good enough. And I, I looked at him, and I said, Wow, are we really defining ourselves in digital these days by the word good enough? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that's not really the case anymore. No, now digital far exceeds what we could do in, in film. If you look at the ability of the sensor, the dynamic range, even of the less expensive cameras, you know, 12, 13 stops of dynamic range, mm -hmm. it's incredible. And then you look at the ISO capability, I mean, we talked earlier about how I set my high ISO on the new A7R2 at 12,800 because it's usable. Right. I mean, it's like Tri-X. 
Yeah. Or, you know, or a 400 speed color negative film. Right. So it was, it's perfectly usable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've got the ISO, we got a dynamic range. We don't have to worry about highlights and shadows anymore as long as you're watching where your, your clipping is and mm -hmm. understand your digital medium. So we've exceeded good enough. We exceeded good enough there mm -hmm. and we exceeded good enough there. Back in the film days, you could look at a lens and stop it down and, you know, take a magnifier out and say, oh, look at the, the grass on the edge. It's, you know, kind of like bending in and, you know, it's not, it's soft. It may be good enough, but, you know, it was okay. Mm -hmm. It was filming. You didn't look that way. Now we're looking at pixels. Mm -hmm. And we looked at... Which is a bit neurotic. It is, but we're doing this because we have readers and ourselves that are curious more than anything else. It's curious about how far, you know, we can take this grade of excellence anymore. One of the things that we're doing on, we, we looked at the two baddest lenses earlier, the 25 and the 85 made by Zeiss. Ma amazing lens maker. Are these lenses, you know, the, the pinnacle that all lenses should be compared to? And we shot comparisons. Frankly, when we look at the files, I can't tell the difference. I can't find the differences. Mm -hmm. They're all that good. So what we do is we'll just give you the JPEGs and the readers can take a look at these and go pixel peeping all they want. But here, here's an issue. There are reviewers on the web like you and me who, yes, we look at things at 100% on screen, but we make prints. And that is our reference point. And so we'll make 13 by 19 or 1722 or even 2024 prints put them up on the viewing box, stand back, and look at them. And that's a whole other way of looking at an image. There's the looking at it, at, you know, one-to-one -one on screen. There's looking at a large print. But they're different experiences. And then there are the reviewers who are literally pixel peepers. Yeah. You know, they're, they're magnifying things to 400% and, you know, doing arcane and obscure analysis. And... I don't know, I kind of like looking at those reviews, but I don't give them much credence. You know, to me, you know, the, some of those mm -hmm. reviews are, uh, you know, they're amusing, they're interesting, but they're not what motivates me when it comes to making equipment decision sure. choices. And I've had some experience recently. I've used everything from cameras with one-inch sensors, which I think is the smallest size that gives good, decent quality, professional quality, you know, up to a medium format. And I've shot everything from 16 megapixels to 80 megapixels. And when you get right down to it, for most applications, they kind of look quite similar. And that's, that's one of the dirty little secrets of this industry. Yeah. The small cameras, as long as it's got quality lenses and the execution is done with care, you know, tripod, self-timer, high shutter speed, optimum aperture, all that good stuff. Uh, it's sometimes very difficult to tell the difference. It is, and I think what... We had this discussion a few days ago, and we need to sort of come back to what the roots are of photography. You know, let's put the hardware aside for a minute, and, and remember that throughout the history of photography, we had a camera, had film, took a picture, and eventually we ended up making a print. And when you look at the great artists, such as, you know, name droppers, Ansel Adams, Edward uh, Weston, Ed, you, yeah. you, uh, so. all the great guys that made great prints. What made us want to be like them is we saw a print by them. The subtleties, we would be able to go up to the print and take a look at the print. You know, they weren't concerned. They were shooting with the most primitive cameras in most cases that there ever was. There was Lenses that we'd now kick out of bed. Yeah, they weren't even <laughs> concerned with that. You know, it was whatever they could afford, you know, whatever, you mean, know, there were wooden film holders, for God's sakes, with, you know, tape holding them together. So, you know, it was still all about the print. And I think we forget this. Mm -hmm. we're, you know, we're so used to passing our iPhones around our iPads or, you know, putting an image up on the Internet and saying, this is the way it should be. Mm -hmm. The hardware is really good these days, and mm -hmm. actually it's so good it's very hard to uh, definitively measure the differences except maybe in user interface, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Mm -hmm. So I think what it comes down to now is, you know, let's make the print. 
you know, how do we go and make a print in the end and evaluate it? And of course, printmaking is a whole new thing, and we've talked about, and uh, we do want to actually prepare something in the future, talking about the print more, and so that's something we're going to come back to because mm -hmm. we both believe in it so much. What we have found probably in the last few weeks, as you have said, is that the gear is so good, yeah. it's hard to discern a difference. And if I was to make an 1117 print from both my Fujis, my RX100, my um, Sony RX104, the Sony A7, I mean, all these, and I put them on a, on a table, you probably would be hard-pressed to tell the difference of where they mm -hmm. came from. So what I think is important for our readers and a photographer now is not to get caught up in, you know, the pixels, the lossless raw, you know, an R channel, G channel, deviations, <laughs> and all the things that some of these guys want to get involved in, is, you know, my feeling was, and I remember my instructor when I was in school said, you know, I challenged him, I said, like, what's the difference between Panatomic X and Tri-X? Why do you want to use Tri-X when Panatomic X gives you such finer stuff? He says, you know, he says, get a roll, put it in the camera, <laughs> go out and shoot with it. Make a choice. It's a tool. It's you know. It's it's the brush. It's the the mm -hmm. paint. It's what you work with. You define it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we all have to do. We forget that we have to go out and take pictures. Right. And let me just throw one final thought in the mix, and it comes from the fact that you and I go back not just to the days of film, but back into the '60s and '70s yep. uh, when we were working as as professional photographers. Uh, Remember Ansel Adams, you yes. mentioned oh. the zone system. Yep. It was the Bible. It was the way that you exposed. <clears throat> you understood that uh, there were 10 stops of dynamic range, and then you could pull or push the development to compress or expand the... Or slide uh, along the yeah, scale. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. To, you know, it's just like today, you know, we move the exposure yeah. compensation uh, wheel on the back of the camera. But think about it. Adams's mantra was the 10 stops of the zone system, but zero was the blackest black and 10 was the whitest white. No detail, no detail. What that left was eight stops of visible difference. Today, modestly priced cameras have 10, 11, 12 stops of dynamic range. So we're looking at cameras that have three and four stops more real dynamic range than the best that film, black and white yep. film, could ever give us. So I feel like standing on top of a tall building and saying, you know, come the revolution, <laughs> nobody should worry about you know, dynamic range. Come on, let's move on. And, and you know, and here's the sad thing. It's easier on web forums to talk about the minutia yep. of bells and whistles and gear and knobs and all of this than it is to talk about image making. Yep. Image making is hard to talk about. You have to just do it. And there's, you know, one, one of the fortunate things is there's a lot of things to help us do it right and better mm -hmm. and to, to make that. But really for all the noise we make about the hardware, all the noise we make about the lenses, to me these days, it's more of a comfort. Does that camera fit in my hand well? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, do I, my fingers push the wrong button or can I operate the menu or quickly get to the settings mm -hmm. that I want? And those are the things that you know that I bitch about. Yeah. Is ergonomics, haptics, those are the things I care about because image quality, eh, you know. Well, and you know what? They're good enough. <laughs> That's what I mean. And, I'm, and I don't <laughs> want to open up a whole argument about the iPhone. But, you know, we're talking 6 megapixel or an 8 megapixel, you know, sensors on an iPhone, which are, you know, phase one started out with a 6 megapixel sensor at $19,000. <laughs> right. yeah. And, you know, they were fantastic. Mm -hmm. You know, in the end, and I, I had a, an exhibit that I was part of recently, and it was an interesting evening because people would walk around and go, wow, I really like the way you handled that, or this is really cool. Not one person asked what camera did you shoot yeah, that with? Exactly. No one judged the fact that I used a phase one camera for one of those shots and I use an iPhone for another. Exactly. And nobody even knew the difference. They just looked at the interesting aspects of the image exactly. and what it was capable of doing. So, you know, I think what we need to try to do, and if there's anything else that we've tried to make a point here, 
Both you and I enjoy taking pictures. Mm -hmm. We make a joke about it sometimes. Well, let's just go out and take a picture. Or, you know what, we got to stop the car and at least push the button because <laughs> I've got to have my fix. Yeah, right. But, you know, my fix isn't the hardware, the computer software, the, the power of the chip. It's nice to know it's all in there mm -hmm. and working, but it does. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's no different than, you know, having a V8 four barrel in a car and knowing that you've got the power if you want it, mm -hmm. you know, and it feels good when you drive good it. Good analogy. But driving the curves on a nice country road that's the experience, whether it's in a Toyota Corolla or a Ferrari. You know, it's, yeah, there are differences, but it's the experience. And so I was thinking, you know, I used to have a dark room like you did. We've talked about, I had my stereo system in the dark room, duct tape over, you know, the, the <laughs> lighted Morant styles, you know, Bose speakers, you know, the enlarger, you know, a stool, and, you know, I could do it all, nice sinks. And, you know, for me, a Sunday afternoon was in the dark room, making mm -hmm. a prints, you know, in the end, taking them out, having them, putting them on the table and admiring the four or six prints that I made. You know what? I've still got a dark room. It's a mm -hmm. 5K IMAX sitting on a desk <laughs> in a beautifully lit room with speakers, you know, on either right. side. An Epson printer. And, you know, I have my music. I got all the tools that I need, both in, you know, many variations of software. Mm -hmm. And I've got great Epson printers, which I can make my prints on. Mm -hmm. And I've got big tables. And when I put that picture down, it's done. And, you know, I have a new word for pictures and prints. You know, when I put a print on the wall, I like to watch people. Say I make a 20 by 24. I like to watch people four feet behind and they stand there and they look at it and then all of a sudden they take a step forward and a step forward. When they can get to be six inches from the picture and you know the the cameras that we have are delivering such mm -hmm. detail, I call it immersive imaging. You exactly. know, when you can take your viewer and immerse them into the image, mission accomplished. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the person turns around and goes, God, that's a beautiful print. Yeah. And not we, once asked. We love, we take pleasure in seeing detail. That's why we go to the optometrist and get glasses when our eyes start to go fuzzy. We like to see detail. Uh, and I sometimes drive without my glasses. Oh, God. <laughs> no, I, I see just fine without my glasses. My glasses make things. I can, I can read the lettering on a billboard an extra 100 meters away. The point is... I don't drive much without my glasses, simply because I like to see the detail of the world around me. But for the larger picture of things, no pun intended, you know, I can do it without my glasses. Human beings thrive on the experience of detail. Yep. And so that's why we love these lenses and these cameras and high resolution sensors. Uh, so it's interesting, and there are different perspectives. I mean, we're sitting here saying, well, on the one hand and on the other hand, and I'll bet you there are two or three more hands that we oh, haven't touched on. There are. And I, I think the, the, the point is when you know, we, why we decided to sit down and, and do this is because with all the equipment that's come our way in the last two months, uh, we, it all functions, it all works. And, you know, we've had a lot of fun testing it and talking about it and, oh, you know, do you know you can do 960 frames per second slow-mo and stuff? And, you know, we don't even do that, but it's no. just kind of nice to know. It's, cool, it's kind of cool to watch a bee's <laughs> wings go, and, and so, you know, I, I'll never do anything with it, but I will do something with the pictures like we took the other night mm -hmm. when, you know, it's sunset. Yeah. To, to me, those are the ones. Do we walk off with a couple portfolio prints from this? And I stress that... What I think more than anything else, and I'm, I'm speaking for myself, but hopefully you at the same time, is that read the reviews, they're fun to read, they're interesting to learn, but you know, let's not forget what we call ourselves, and that's a photographer. That is You're not a, a camographer? Not a camographer. I take pictures, I make prints. Mm -hmm. If it pleases me, mm -hmm. I've had a good day. Well, we've had a few good days. Yes, we have. And okay. I think in the end, what I want to say is don't get caught up in the hardware. Enjoy the cameras you have. You don't necessarily need to go out and buy the newest and the latest, as long as you're taking good pictures. It's fun to have the newest. It's fun to have the most megapixels. Nice to know you have what you need to you know, have. But it's not all about that in the end. Mm -hmm. Just enjoy what photography is all about. The way we have here in the Palouse area of Washington State. Michael, I've had more fun with you over the last few days. Always, always fun have. to get together. And let's not forget our friend and videographer who we never see, but it's always behind the camera. Who turned on the video cameras and went off and had a nap. <laughs> Can you believe it? He's lying there under a tree. So anyway, thanks. We just had to say that, and we'll see you on the Luminous Landscape. So long.